Hello, and welcome to episode 13 of my podcast, Refining Rhetoric. I'm Robert Bortons, your host. In today's episode, I'll be interviewing Brandon Steinhauser, the founding partner of Steinhauser Strategies and CC Mom. In the show, she shares about her journey with homeschooling as a full-time working mom and her public service work that supports the parent's ability to choose education that fits their family best. After that, I'll do a brief recap and unpack a few of the tools of learning from our interview, address food shortages as our current event topic, and finally, we will have Classical Crypto with Will McCreary. Let's get started. Classical Conversation Studios presents Refining Rhetoric with CEO Robert Bortons, a podcast where faith, business, politics, and classical education meet. Join us as we use the classical tools of rhetoric to seek truth in every arena of life. Welcome to another episode of my podcast, Refining Rhetoric. Today, I'm excited to be joined by Randon Steinhauser. Brandon is the founding partner of Steinhauser Strategies, which specializes in creating public relation campaigns, influencing public policy debates, and building innovative digital movements. Brandon is an expert in her field, having worked in more than 30 states on issues of advocacy and political campaigns, assisting clients with media relations, coalition development, strategic communication, and government affairs. She currently lives in Austin, Texas, with her husband and business partner, She is also the proud mom of four children who she homeschools with Classical Conversation. Brandon, it is great to have you on the show. Thanks for joining me. Thank you for having me. I'm excited. Yeah, so it sounds like you're doing a lot and homeschooling, which is awesome. So I'm sure we'll dive into how you get it all done. But I went to Clemson, but you went to South Carolina, which is okay. Um, So tell us a little bit about uh, your South Carolina experience and where you went after that. Yeah, sure. So I'm originally from a small town um, in South Carolina called Blythewood. Uh, It's right outside of Columbia. And um, first in my family to go to college. So USC felt like the kind of natural destination for me. Um, I loved it. I did undergrad in English and political science. During my time there um, was really when I got the political bug. So I did an internship in the governor's office Um, At the time, it was Governor Mark Sanford, and uh, I just fell in love with the process of public policy, the legislative uh, environment, and that sort of led me on a path to get to Washington, D.C. I started my career um, on Capitol Hill working for Senator Jim DeMint, um, who later went to the Heritage Foundation and is is now very active still in Washington, D.C., but that was just an amazing experience for a small town girl whose parents were not political, um, you know, just kind of seeing the inside the belly of the beast, if you will, of Washington, um, realized pretty quickly that I just had a love and passion for education and um, read a book at the time about charter schools. And that was kind of the first time I ever even started thinking about choice in the education landscape and ended up getting hired to work for uh, former Secretary of Education, Betsy DeVos. At the time, she was um, the board chair of the American Federation for Children, uh, which is a national advocacy organization that focused on school choice. And I was able to travel the country from coast to coast, uh, working with families all across the spectrum from uh, families who were interested in uh, specifically Catholic education or virtual education, and then of course, homeschooling. And it was very much from a public policy perspective. And so that really got me on this path toward being super passionate about education policy and led me to do the work I'm doing today. That's awesome. How did you guys start uh, Steinhauser Strategies? Were you, um, was that post babies or pre babies or um, how, how did that all get started? Yeah. Well, so as I mentioned, I, I was with the American Federation for Children and I was doing that full time. Um, they had a, a target state strategy where they were looking at 10 to 12 states every year. And my husband, who I met at the time in DC, um, was working for an organization called Freedom Works, uh, which was all about limited government issue advocacy campaigns, and decided after the 2012 election to consider coming home to Texas. And I was very excited about this opportunity. We knew at the time we wanted to kind of put down roots and find a place to call home, find a place to raise a family. But Texas was not on that state list for American Federation for Children. So I somehow convinced them to let me stay on the team, but as a consultant and brought on some projects locally here in Texas. 
that transition is really what led me to start Steinhauser Strategies. Um, I still wanted to do the national work, but I also knowing that we were most likely going to be, you know, permanent residents of Texas, really wanted to take the experiences that I had professionally from across the country and apply that to the work that I knew could get done here in Texas. So um, launched the company in January of 2013 with with one client and a one bedroom apartment, you know, with a laptop, mm-hmm. the whole startup story. Um, and it was really an amazing experience. So definitely pre-kids. I was super young, um, kind of fake it till you make it. Honestly, like I was just out there trying to meet anybody I could. And here we are, you know, eight years later, I think, um, my husband was my first employee. So, you know, in more ways than one, he jokes that I'm the boss, but it's, it's been a really great blessing that we have grown together, um, in our business and the work that we do. And, you know, a few years into it was when we had our first child, Bonnie, um, who's now almost six and, you know, being self-employed has pros and cons. And one of the pros is that you get a lot of flexibility, right? You get to kind of be your own boss. One of the cons, and and I don't think we kind of talk about this a lot as female entrepreneurs is that you don't really get maternity leave, (laughs) right? Like it doesn't turn off. Um, And so it definitely, that was the beginning, I would say of like the working mother balancing act that I've been trying to do ever since. Um, Because you're, you're pouring your passion into your career, but then you realize very quickly that there's absolutely nothing you could be more passionate about than your own children. And so that's been um, just kind of the ongoing uh, opportunity and challenge over the years is to find the way to to keep those things in balance. Uh, yeah, that's great. I know. Yeah, my mom, I don't know if she hired my dad or she probably didn't pay him, but I know he was he was probably one of her <laughs> first employees as well. So that's that's pretty exciting. Yes. And just the... Uh, just the power of motherhood and the ability to be able to get things done when the world tells you that's impossible and, you know, you couldn't do it without government intervention or, you know, um, just, just standing up and saying, no, we're going to get it done. And so I appreciate that. Yeah. Thank you. I mean, it, it goes without saying too, I think, um, as a society, we're doing so much more now to empower women, but we can't forget about our strong men and we can't forget about the amazing dads. And I will say 110%, I would not be able to do a third of what I do every day or professionally or personally, or be the mother that I am without the supportive partner that I have in my husband. And I think, you know, now more than ever, we strong women and strong wives need to stand up for our strong husbands. And so I just want to give a shout out out there to all the amazing dads, um, because, you know, it, it does take a team and we're so blessed that we are both, you know, fully committed to this kind of crazy, beautiful, chaotic life that we have. Yeah. I think, um, you know, dads need to be stepping up and supporting their wives and everything that they do. And of course the Bible tells us to love our wives as uh, Jesus loved the church. And of course we know he, ultimately laid down his own life um, for that. So I appreciate having a dad who's kind of mimicked and mirrored that in his own life, uh, putting aside his career uh, to help my mom start classical conversations. So um, that's cool to hear. Uh, Y'all have a similar story. So what what got you started homeschooling? So you you have this uh, thriving or just startup uh, strategies company, and now you're starting to have children. So how, how did you get into the homeschooling? Yeah. I mean, you know, I think again, because I came from kind of the education public policy world, a lot of my work focused on working with parents and supporting them and finding the best educational choice for their child. Again, whether that was a religious school, a charter school, a virtual school. And I honestly had never considered homeschooling. Um, it wasn't something that was, you know, the passion inside me from day one of being a mom. When Bonnie, my oldest was three, we put her in just kind of like a little two day a week preschool program just to give her kind of mom's day out, give me some time where I could, could focus. And I remember, I mean, we were already doing so much at home. I didn't think about it as homeschool. I thought about it as my job as a mom to, you know, work on handwriting and colors and letters. And we had a meeting with the teacher where this, you know, young woman basically was trying to convince me that my daughter needed to be there five days a week. And she's three. And I remember going home and just having like this really just bad feeling about this idea that like my kid needed to be somewhere else with someone else five days a week. And 
I think honestly, the next week I pulled her out of the program entirely. And I was just like, Nope, I'm not like, this is not the direction we're going in. There's never going to be a time where I'm dropping my kid off for five days a week and seeing them at the end of the day when none of us are at our best. Right. Right. And so this opened up just a whole conversation between my husband and I on, you know, our, our values, education, how we wanted to educate our children, full disclosure. You know, when we moved to Austin and we ended up buying a house, we bought our house based on the very best school district. So we came into this thinking we're going to send our kids to the neighborhood school. And by the grace of God, by the time she was three years old, my eyes were opened. And um, I just, that, that flame had started. And over the course of the next two years, I would say I became pretty obsessed with homeschooling. And um, I read your mom's book, I read every single book that I could find. I just fell in love with the Charlotte Mason style of homeschooling and the the connection between motherhood and education and would stay up late at night reading and following all the Instagram accounts and all of the podcasts and all the YouTube videos. And I mean, by the time Bonnie was four, four and a half, it was, we were set. And at four and a half, she started classical conversations in our local community here in Lake Travis. And we haven't looked back since. I mean, it's, it is without question, um, the best program, the best place for a young child to thrive. Um, and you know, I've, I've been talking a lot about Bonnie, but I do have three other children, um, that came after her. So yeah. 18 months after Bonnie was born, we had a set of identical twins, Okay, two more girls. And then we also have an almost eight month old little boy. So it's, it is truly chaotic, but I just, I cannot tell you the blessing that classical conversations has been to our family because it's given us community. It's given us collaboration with other families with like-minded values, and it's given us accountability to hold ourselves accountable and look at each week and figure out, okay, what are we learning this week? How can we supplement? What can we, what areas can we grow in? And it's just been a, a really, really beautiful thing to start our homeschool journey with classical conversations. So thank you for that. Oh, you're welcome. And, you know, I kind of relate a little bit to what you're saying. We don't have twins, but we have uh, our oldest is seven, Lily, and uh, then my middle child, Trey's five, and then we've got a two-year-old. And so um, I know it's it's helpful for our family to hold us accountable and getting what we need to do done. And and I think we experience all the benefits of community, which is, of course, one of the reasons that uh, my mom started Classical Conversations. And yeah, I really appreciate what you said about sending a kid away for five days. And, you know, if you see them at night, you're not getting either person's best. Because a lot of times we hear people who may be in a public or private school who are considering homeschooling, but they say, you know, I don't know I could be with my kids all the time. And it's so important to remember, like you're with them in the morning when you're rushing to get out. And then you're with them at the end of the day when you're both tired from, you know, working all days and you're not giving your kids the best and you're not getting the best from them. And I think homeschooling you know, really lets you have that opportunity to spend that quality time together and, and build that relationship. For sure. And I think, you know, a lot of times people will ask me like, how are you doing all of this? You know, there's not enough hours in the day. And the truth is, is that homeschooling looks different for everyone and your listeners know this, right? I mean, I'm still very new on our homeschooling journey, but I've already learned some big, important lessons. You know, we as adults, we are allowed to have bad days and guess what? Our kids are too. So if they're having a bad day, you know, I'm not going to push something on them, but when they're having a great day, we could go two hours and we haven't stopped, right? They're just on fire with learning and reading and, and sitting down and paying attention. And so giving your children that grace to recognize that it doesn't have to be within the constraints of a traditional public school education schedule, right? Sometimes our best learning days are Saturday mornings at 8 30, you know, and we're just on fire other days at two o'clock on Tuesdays, we are just having some quiet time and everybody's playing Legos because that's just where we are on that day. And I think that's one of the most important things that I've had to learn is kind of breaking some of the traditional rules and giving yourself grace and, and recognizing, you know, 
my kids, including my four-year-old twins, know every single word of the timeline song, <laughs> right? Prior to the timeline song, there were things that I had never even been exposed to because, you know, with my public school education. Right. And so I just, I think, you know, what we're exposing them to through classical conversations, the curriculum, all of the wraparound services, the amazing online support of resources from other moms. I mean, I love going on to classical conversations and looking at all of the amazing worksheets and activities that families come up with each week. So I think that's one of the most important things to keep in mind is that there's not one right way to homeschool and classical conversations has allowed us that structure to build it in our own way. It's almost like, here's the recipe. Now you go make it your own. And I love that. Yeah. So we hear that a lot and love for you to address, you know, parents are like, well, we both either work full time or, you know, I would, I work part time. So how are, how do you balance that? And what are some tips and tricks you may have learned over the last few years? Yeah, I think scheduling and being disciplined is super important. I mean, that that kind of is contrary to what I was just saying in terms of, you know, every day is a little different, but at least having some sort of outline of, you know, here's my husband's work schedule. Here's, you know, the few things I have going on. I will be completely honest in that my work has just taken the backseat right now to, to everything else going on because nothing is more important. The projects I am working on, everyone is so supportive of our lifestyle choices that it's okay if I've got a kid running in the background when I'm doing a conference call because they understand where I am kind of in my own motherhood journey. And that's a really, uh, really big blessing. So I know it's not for everyone. I just want to say like, we we've been super blessed. Um, you know, carving out dedicated time, even if, you know, it is, it seems like they're just not picking up on it. If it just turns into reading aloud with them and holding yourself accountable to do that activity with them, my husband and I both participate in educating our children. And so he's kind of the geography, history, science. Um, and I do a lot of the literature. I do a lot of our handicrafts and poetry and music and, and then just kind of keeping us on schedule, honestly, is a big part of my job, making sure we're checking in regularly on how we're doing with reading and math and keeping those essentials in, you know front and center. But again, I think just recognizing you can learn and your kids can learn anytime. I mean, whether you're in the car and you're driving, that's when we listen to the timeline song, right? We don't sit down and, you yeah. know, force them to listen to it. It's something fun that we do with the windows down and we make it a joyful experience for them. So, um, being flexible, but also carving out dedicated time to make sure you're, you're hitting the basics, I think is really important. And then leaning into your community, finding other families that are at the same stage as you and, just being open to collaboration and supporting each other and finding ways to build really meaningful relationships with other families who are on this journey as well. So it sounds like one is find a, either a business opportunity or workplace that respects your motherhood and that job as well. And of course, one of the blessings of the COVID um, is people got used to the kids running in the background of their Zoom meetings. So there seems to be a lot more corporate acceptance of that and uh, yeah, having a supportive husband and you don't need to do it, you know, in that regular public school timeline, you know, you can work those times that, that work well for you. And I think um, those are all, all great tips for some parents who might be considering homeschooling and trying to figure out how to balance either a part or full-time job at the same time. Now, you've done a lot of work with school choice, and uh, what does really school choice mean to you, and uh, what are some uh, accomplishments or wins that you've seen uh, throughout your career uh, supporting that effort? Yeah, school choice is just fundamentally the idea that no one knows a child better than their own parents. And so when it comes to their education, the most important thing in their life is the formation of uh, not just their brain, but I would argue their soul. And so figuring out the right path for them to grow um, and to learn and to grow into a loving, thoughtful, faithful servant leader for our society, honestly. And so making sure that parents feel empowered to choose the school or the educational environment that works best for them, whether that is a traditional neighborhood public school 
a public charter school, a virtual school, a magnet school, a co-op, a homeschool, a, you know, micro school. Now we have so many options, right? Because with yeah. COVID parents realize like it doesn't have to be this one size fits all system. And so um, we've really seen an explosion of parents kind of taking back control of their children's education in a very empowering way not just because of COVID, but obviously more recently with what we're learning is being taught in our public schools, the type of curriculum, the type of ideology that's being pushed, the um, just complete lack of trust and respect for parents as the ultimate authority for their children as they're raising them. And so parents are, are not just empowered, they're kind of fed up. And so as parents are starting to take back that control, they're seeking out alternative options. And that's really where kind of the public policy side comes in. We are paying outrageous property taxes. Much of our taxes go to our local school district. We're opting out of that school, but yet we're still paying into it. And so we believe in a system that allows the dollars to follow the child to the educational environment that works best for them. We, we, in the movement, say fund students, not systems. Right now, we're spending outrageous amounts of money on public schooling. We're not getting great results. We're not seeing increases in educational attainment and outcomes. And we're learning that our kids are being taught things that we may not agree with. And so we're working really hard at home to shape their hearts and minds. And then everything we're investing in them is being thrown out the window, challenged and tested in our traditional school system. And so more than ever, we we really need to advocate for parental rights and parental choice in education to make sure that the government just gets out of the way and lets kids thrive in the environment that works best for them. What do you see? Is there opposition to this idea of, you know, letting parents choose the best education for their kids and what are the are there groups work that you're working actively against or yeah on the other side of the issue well i mean it's one of those questions that if you you sit back and you think about it long enough i'm sure the answer will come to you it's the folks who benefit by the public school system um, it's the teachers unions it's the superintendents it's the system right um, we as parents should be viewed as consumers we should be able to take our funding and choose every individual or every teacher or every program for our children. And if it's not working, we should be able to take those dollars somewhere else. That's how it works in a private school model. That's how the free market economy works, right? If you're not happy with your outcomes or you're not happy with the product, you can take your dollars and you can go shop somewhere else everywhere except education. Right now, if you are zoned to a neighborhood school that is not working for your kid, and let's say you're a single mom, let's say you cannot afford to send them to a private school, you don't have access to a charter school, or in the case of Texas, we have 120,000 students who are on a charter school wait list. So let's say you're one of those kids that are just waiting and you don't feel like homeschooling is the right fit for your family for whatever reason, you essentially are stuck. Right. And for too many families, that is where they are. And so the public school system has no incentive to improve because that family can't go anywhere else. And so we are actively fighting back against this idea that the children belong to the public schools, that the tax dollars belong to the public schools. They belong to the public good of education for our kids, but that doesn't necessarily mean a government run school. And I think that's really important to, to differentiate is that public education does not necessarily have to mean government funded, government run education. So obviously our biggest opposition is the teachers unions. They are in full force right now out against parents, against choice, against accountability. Again, you know, they kept schools closed much longer than parents wanted. Um, they are, are proponents of masking kids. They are proponents of making sure that critical race theory is being taught in public schools. Much of this is, is the antithesis of what most American families want for their kids. And so there's, there's a real conflict happening right now. Now, the teachers unions, or at least one of the teachers boards are the ones that sent the letter to the FBI asking them to start investigating these parents speaking up at school. Uh, board events. Is that accurate? Yeah, that is correct. And and we've recently learned that there was actually what, what is being called a snitch hotline set up at the FBI. And they got hundreds, if not thousands of tips 
about parents um, from school leaders, principals, teachers, superintendents. And some of these have leaked in recent days. And a couple of them said, you know, this parent showed up at a school board meeting and I'm concerned because their Facebook profile picture is overtly patriotic or has a don't tread on me flag or they're a member of the NRA, right? Like they're targeting families and individuals whose values and political beliefs don't match theirs. And therefore they are able to somehow say that they feel threatened. They feel threatened by our distinct desire and our God-given motivation to fight for our freedom. For them, everything revolves around government control. So again, it it goes back to that larger conflict that we're seeing. Um, and, And the reality that a lot of parents are saying enough is enough. This is getting out of hand. So it sounds like um, you're very passionate about this. And of course, we love uh, families having choices here at Classical Conversations. Uh, What made you choose homeschooling? I mean, you're very familiar with all the options out there. So what made homeschooling right for your family? I think first and foremost, I just wanted those precious days with my kids. I wanted to be there to teach them to read. I wanted to be the person that gets to have those joyful moments of recognition when they solve the math problem or to be the person that they show their beautiful artwork to. Um, So, you know, I think when I started diving into Charlotte Mason and really just, again, read every book I could get my hands on, on all the different philosophies of home education, it just lit a bonfire inside of my heart. Mm -hmm. And it, it was something that I really honestly had to, um, take to my husband and make that decision together. Right. Because I knew that it was going to mean, you know, I was going to be shifting my focus and taking all of that passion and that energy that I was putting into my career and transitioning much of it into the education of my children. And so, you know, God blessed me with an amazing and supportive husband that when we got down to it and talked about our values and what matters, we were completely aligned. And at first we just kind of were winging it and then decided we were going to look into different classical options. And of course that led us right to classical conversations. Um, We knew we wanted something that was distinctly Christian. And for us seeing that partnership of classical and Christian, and then adding in the community or the collaboration, those three things were kind of what solidified it for us is this is the right choice for our family. And you know, we, we sort of formally started with Bonnie, but seeing how much my younger twins, um, are picking up on at such a young age and how, um, you know, we'll be riding down the the street and my daughters will start asking about communism. Right. (laughs) And I'm like, you guys, where did you hear that? And they'll say, Oh, well, we read it in the story of the world. You know, that's our history curriculum that we match to our classical conversations. And so like having thoughtful, intellectual discussions with them at an age appropriate level, right? Like bring, like making sure it's still within the age appropriateness for their, for their little minds, but it shows you the power of just being in the driver's seat of their education and opening them up to so many different ideas and just being that, that person with them and, and holding them in the struggles and the challenges and then celebrating with them in those moments of victory where they, finally accomplish whatever it is that they're, they're working toward. That's beautiful. I love it. So did it take you a long time to join classical conversations or did you uh, kind of jump right in after learning about the details? We did a, a, a visit day. So we did a community visit day an open house and we just felt so welcomed and we have an amazing uh, director here. I'm going to give a shout out to Autumn. Um, She just does an amazing job of welcoming families. I think she has either six or seven kids. They've all are either in classical conversations or have already graduated. And so she can give a real heartfelt testimony toward the impact that it's had in her own family. And I think for me, when I saw the community um, on just that day where we visited, I just instantly knew like, yes, we're going to give this a shot. And it was, it was really great to be able to do that so quickly and join them. And then we had that next summer off and we just kind of did our own classical conversations with the curriculum to get ready for the fall. And we were able to jump right in and 
We haven't looked back since. Honestly, it's been, there was never a question. It was really just for us sitting down and figuring out how to tackle each week and how do we break out the subjects we love to supplement. And so if, you know, for example, if we're studying the three types of rocks, then our family outing that weekend may be something that involves us, you know, going out to our ranch and digging in the dirt and seeing if we can find all three types of rock. So we, we put a lot of thought into it and trying to just enjoy every moment of it and recognize that if you get through the whole week, that's awesome. If you just get through half of it, that's great too. Love to hear that. Final question for you. It's election season. And of course, it's a lot easier for you and others if people who uh, are, you know, champion your cause or know you get elected. So what are some things uh, homeschoolers or even classical conversations families can do during this season to make sure we get good representation uh, this year? Yeah, it's a great question. I would say that all politics start local. So know who's running for your school board. Even if your kids are not in the public schools, you want your uh, the values that are being taught in those public schools to be representative of your own, right? That's how we, as voters, we have that right. So get involved locally, start there and figure out who represents you at the local level. That's way less intimidating than trying trying to like make a difference in Congress, right? Like, um, so obviously start local, but of course figure out who represents you in the state house. Who's your state representative? Who's your state senator? Um, where does your governor stand on the issue of parental rights and freedom and education? Making sure that um, you know you are engaged in the process of having your voice heard for whether it's homeschool freedom. Like, don't tread on me. Don't come asking for, you know, an assessment of my kid and don't come knock on my door and ask to do a home evaluation, right? Like that is happening in places across this country. And so uniting together to fight and protect our homeschool freedom is one. Um, But then again, as it goes to the larger conversation that we're having, asking folks how they feel about mask mandates in school, asking folks how they feel about vaccine mandates, wherever you come down on that, you know, your elected leaders are supposed to represent your values. And so holding them accountable, getting involved in the process and being willing to ask them tough questions. You can do it with a smile, but you can ask them tough questions. Mm. Well, thank you so much. And, uh, Just thank you for sharing your wisdom with us today and coming on our show. And if listeners want to learn more about you and what you're doing, is there any websites or social media outlets that you'd love to connect with them on? Sure. Yeah. So Steinhauser Strategies um, is our company. And then I am on Instagram. It's just Randon Marie. And um, it's it's just a great way, I think, for for moms especially to stay connected on social media and encourage and inspire each other. Um, and get a lot of really great ideas and lessons for homeschool curriculum. So I'd love to connect with folks there and really appreciate you having me on the show. God bless and have a good one. Thank you. Well, I really enjoyed our conversation today. And now let's review one of the tools of each of the stages of learning. And the first tool we'll review is expressing as part of the five core habits of grammar, the repetition that builds knowledge. And it really blessed me to hear that Raiden's experience with classical conversations has been so positive. We're so thankful for the wonderful community that she and her family are experiencing and that Cece has had a chance to serve them as they homeschool. The tool of comparison, which is part of the five common topics of dialectic, the questions that develop understanding. In our interview, Raiden explained that her position on government-funded education through a series of comparisons. Now, if you're interested in diving a little bit deeper into my personal position on the issue, you should read an article that I wrote a couple years ago called School Choice versus School Choice. And you can find that on the CC Connected Writer Circles articles online. And now we'll look at the tool of delivery. It's part of the five canons of rhetoric, the artifacts that demonstrate wisdom. We talked about uh, how homeschoolers and parents should address their representatives. Um, It is election season. It's an election year here in the United States for most of the country. And Brandon really encouraged you to use your rhetorical skills and communicate with your elected representatives. And so I just encourage you all to go and do that. So I really enjoyed this episode and uh, be sure to check out my personal thoughts on school choice in my article, School Choice versus school choice. 
And now let's practice these 15 tools of learning through current events, and we'll talk about food shortages. According to the National Park Service, there were 20 million victory gardens at the end of World War II, and they were producing roughly 40% of the vegetables consumed in the United States. I'm sure that number is a lot lower today. This year, I more than doubled the size of our garden. I've planted some corn, some peas, uh, carrots, as well as sap peas and uh, watermelon and some cantaloupe as well. And uh, I wish I'd put in some potatoes. I know that's a big staple and something that really has a good bang for your buck, and I'll probably look at doing that next year. One of the reasons I doubled the size of our garden is I knew that inflation was not transitory and that uh, this uh, was going to affect our food prices and uh, the amount of product that was available to us uh, well before those in Washington, D.C. would admit it. You've likely heard about the baby formula shortage, and it's been as high as a seen numbers 40 to 60 percent of um, baby formula was out of stock at certain points this year. History has shown us that a feature of socialism is the bread lines. Uh, But as classical educators, how can we approach this looming food shortage issue? And of course, we do that by using 15 tools of learning. And from the tools of grammar, we look at attending, uh, which is really to differentiate the words from another. And so we look at the words food shortages and the word inflation and how are those things similar and how are they alike and uh, define those. And in the tool of naming, you know, we want to name what are the top grain exporters. Now in the tools of the dialectic, let's look at relationship. How much of the world's grain does Ukraine produce? How much of it does India? Because in the tool of circumstance, you might find that India earlier this year banned the export of wheat, citing threats to food security. So if India is doing this, would circumstances maybe reflect that other countries might do this as well? And then testimony. You know, what are local farmers saying? You know, it'd be great to take a field trip out with your family to the local farmer's market not only to support local and small businesses and uh, maybe get some fresh produce, uh, but also understand, you know, how is the price of oil affecting them? Are they able to get the products that they need to be able to have a good produce this year? How is the weather um, affecting them? And of course, it's always good to know your local farmers in case there is a uh, significant food shortage And finally, in the five canons of rhetoric, the tool of invention. You know, what can my family do to prepare? You know, at worst, uh, you guys will learn a little bit more about farming um, and maybe get some fresh vegetables. And maybe your kids will have a greater appreciation to where their food comes from. At best, you'll be able to skip those bread lines for a little bit longer than your neighbor, at least until they come and seize the means of production. But that probably won't happen. Still, it's a great opportunity for us to teach our kids a little bit more about where our food comes from and be prepared in case the worst case scenario does happen. Next up is Classical Crypto with Will. I hope you are enjoying that segment. I know I am learning a lot, so stay tuned. Hey, I want to tell you about American Heritage Girls. If you're looking for an opportunity for your daughter to grow in her character and leadership skills, consider joining American Heritage Girls today. American Heritage Girls is a Christ-centered program for girls 5 to 18 years of age with troops in all 50 states and in 15 countries. American Heritage Girls volunteer troop leaders help girls to grow in their faith, cultivate a heart of service, enjoy the great outdoors, have fun in the community with one another, and build leadership skills that will last a lifetime. Ultimately, American Heritage Girls encourages them to become confident, competent, Christ-honoring women of integrity. And you can learn more at homeschool.americanheritagegirls.org. That's homeschool.americanheritagegirls.org for more information. Now back to our podcast.
Hello, thanks for listening to Classical Crypto with Will today. We are going to cover what is called crypto staking or yield farming. Now, an investing term we need to get down today is APR. Most of you hopefully know that APR stands for annual percentage rate. This term is mostly used in the finance world when it comes to lending. If a bank or a credit card company is loaning you money, the credit card interest rate is the price you pay for borrowing money. That is the annual percentage rate. Most people understand the basics of investing, and perhaps the most common investing catchphrase is buy low, sell high. That is the ideal situation. Well, savvy investors know that there are multiple ways of accumulating more crypto or whatever your investment is and getting greater returns if you know what to do during the process of investing. There can be a long time in between buying low and selling high. Let's study how to make money during that time. Let's use a real estate example and I'll tie it directly into crypto and you can see the correlation. Let's say Sally is a real estate investor. She follows trends. She discovers an up and coming suburb that is projected to grow in value over the next 10 years. It's the perfect setup. She purchases a home for $200,000 and can sell it 10 years later for $300,000. Let's just put that example out there. That would be the ideal situation for a real estate investor. Buying low, selling high, most of us get that concept, but here's what I'm trying to drive home today. What about all that space in between? She purchased the home for $200,000. She's gonna sell it for $300,000 for a profit of $100,000, but 10 years is a long time. Well, if you're a real estate investor, you put in a renter during that time. It could be a short-term rental, which is like an Airbnb or VRBO, or get a long-term renter in there, someone who rents for six months or more at a time. Point is, you're making money while you buy low and sell high. That is very smart. And if you're doing that, you're on the flip side of the APR. So if you're the lendee, if you're the person borrowing money, you have to pay that APR, that annual percentage rate, But if you're on the other side of that, you're an investor, you're the actual person lending out your asset. So in the case of Sally, if she's getting a yield, she's uh, getting rent checks, right? That's the side you want to be on. Now let's apply this to crypto. The crypto cycles, there are highs and lows in crypto. They usually run on a three to four year cycle. So if you purchase low, you may not sell for three years. Again, you're waiting. There's a gap there, right? Well, a strategy that a lot of people don't know about is yield farming or crypto staking. There are companies out there that want to pay you to lend them your crypto before you sell. So now I hope you know what I'm talking about. Let's go a step further and lay out a couple rules of thumb for crypto staking. Number one, stable coin staking is perhaps the safest form of staking. Stable coins are cryptos that are pegged directly to the dollar. That means that their value is not supposed to fluctuate like other cryptos. It sits at the value of the dollar. As the dollar loses a little bit of value year after year, so do the stable coins. But they don't have these drastic swings of 70% up, 50% down. They're more steady because they're pegged to the dollar. These stable coins can generally produce a yield or an APY of 5 to 12% a year if you lend them to the right companies. So that is stable coin investing. Timing. Now, my favorite time to deploy staking or yield farming is during a bull market. In a bull market, digital assets are trending up. Cryptos are increasing in value against the dollar. It's almost a sure win. So here's my example. If I have $1,000 of Bitcoin during a bull market, why would I not lend that $1,000 out to another company who will pay me interest on top of the value that's increasing anyways because we're swinging up? So over six months, it's not unheard of for Bitcoin to double during a bull run. So my $1,000 could turn into $2,000. Well, during that time, If I lent it out to the right company who will pay me an APY, let's just say I got 20% on that. That's another $200 for easy math. So I was in for $1,000 six months later. If I wanted to pull it out for $2,200, I could do that. And that is the power of yield farming. Number three, during a bear market, only stake stablecoin should go without saying. During a bear market, 
uh, digital assets are trending down. So you're losing value. Staking's not as profitable unless it's stable coins. Stable coins, right? Pegged to the dollar. So of course you're getting an actual yield in that scenario. Number four, don't trust any yield farm. Please, I cannot emphasize this enough. Do your research. Make sure you're lending to a reputable company, one that's not over leveraging. Thank you for tuning in today. I hope you learned a little bit about crypto staking and yield farming. Until next time, it's been Will with Classical Crypto. Thank you. Thank you for tuning in to today's episode and be sure to check us out every other Wednesday uh, as new episodes drop and occasionally we'll drop one in between those as we get a uh, special guest. Uh, be sure to like and subscribe and share this with a friend. God bless and have a great day. Thank you for listening to Refining Rhetoric with Robert Bortons. Want more? Make sure to subscribe so you won't miss an episode. You can also follow us on social media to continue the conversation and visit classicalconversations.com forward slash rhetoric to find out how you can join a local homeschool community.